I've entitled this week's sermon, A Word of Warning and Hope. Acts chapter 12, verses 20 through 25. Well, this week we come to the end of Acts 12. And last week we looked at the opening section. It was a section where we saw Herod Agrippa's um, appetite really for persecuting the church. Mainly he was going after church leaders. And we read about the martyrdom of James, son of Zebedee, the brother of the apostle John. And when he was killed, you remember, we read that it pleased the Jews. This persecution of the Christian church pleased the Jews. So Herod Agrippa, he continued with that persecution and he threw Peter into prison to await a similar fate as James. But since it was during the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a feast which lasts probably about seven days, no trial, no sentencing, no execution could take place. It was during a, a holy week, if you will. Herod had Peter thrown in prison instead, but God in His providence took Peter right out from under Herod's nose. You also remember the story with Rhoda, the servant girl at Mary's home. Peter's gone back to Mary's house. They've been praying for Peter. He knocks on the door, and the servant girl Rhoda, she goes to the door, but she doesn't open it. Instead, she recognizes Peter's voice. Peter's still outside. She runs back to tell the disciples who it is and leaves him standing out there. And the disciples say to her, this, this woman is crazy to think that Peter would actually be there. So the scene's all very amusing in one sense. But then when Peter eventually tells the disciples what has happened and how the angel had brought him out of prison, Peter disappears. Luke says that he goes to another place. And Herod is looking for him, but he has the soldiers killed who were guarding Peter because they failed in their duty to keep him secure. So it's, it's at this point that we pick up the rest of the story of Herod. So beginning in Acts chapter 12, verse 20, this is God's Word. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on all his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this portion of your word today. And Lord, even though you inspired it so many years ago, it, it, your truth is eternal. It, it, it has meaning for us today. And Lord, I ask that you would, by the power of your spirit, be our teacher, that you would open it up to our understanding and transform us for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, John Calvin comments on this passage, and he says, This memorable story shows us in a mirror the end that awaits the enemies of the church. It also shows us how greatly God hates pride. Well, well of course, part of the story is this grisly death of Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod Agrippa I having had Peter taken right out from under his nose, having failed to find him, executing the soldiers who were guarding him, he goes down to his palace in Caesarea. Now, Caesarea was a magnificent port city. Uh, it was a city that was near the ancient city of Dan in the Old Testament. It was built in honor of Caesar Augustus and enlarged by Herod the Great into this magnificent harbor port that could dock at least 300 ships at any one given time. There was an amphitheater at Caesarea. An amphitheater was an arena. The Greek word means a theater with seats on all sides. So you can just imagine this big arena where games and reenactments of sea battles and other dramas were held. And it seated somewhere in the range of three to 4,000 people. There was also a hippodrome in Caesarea. And that was really a circular, kind of a U-shaped um, stadium that could seat probably about 20,000 people, and it was where they held horse race, chariot races. 
There was also a magnificent palace at Caesarea that jutted out into the Mediterranean Sea. And according to the Jewish historian Josephus, there was an Olympic-sized swimming pool that was filled with fresh water from an aqueduct that was built to carry water from some 10 miles away from near the foot of a spring, near the foot of Mount Hermon, I mean, excuse me, Mount Carmel. It, it's, it was brought there by gravity. Now, the skill involved in that was breathtaking. So now that we have the background, the setting, there are three things I want us to consider from this passage this morning. First, tyrants are nothing before a sovereign God. Herod Agrippa I was a tyrant. He comes from a family, from a dynasty of tyrants. But there have always been tyrants. That's what you discover when you read the Scripture. Remember the pharaohs in, in Egypt or the tyrants of Babylon and Assyria, uh, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Shalmaneser of Assyria. There's the great emperors of Rome, Nero, Diocletian, Caligula. These are all tyrants. And some persecuted God's church in the Old Testament and others persecuted them in the new uh, to different degrees, but they put men and women of faith to death regularly. There have always been tyrants, and there always will be. And here Luke dwells on Herod Agrippa's death. He describes his demise in some detail because he wants us to see vividly and clearly that tyrants are nothing before a sovereign God. Verse 20, we learn that Herod has had a quarrel with the people of Tyre and Sidon, two cities that were totally dependent on Judea because it, they were the breadbasket. Judea was a breadbasket. And we don't know what Herod has done. It could have had something to do with the ports. But there's no grain coming to Tyre and Sidon. And delegates from those two cities have now come. You might say they've come with their hats in their hands, so to speak. They've come to Herod Agrippa, who's in Caesarea. As you read the account, you get the impression that Herod makes the most of it. Kind of rubs their nose in it if you will. Now, Luke goes on, only describes half of what's going on here. Josephus, in his Antiquities, describes the event in detail, perhaps in more detail than is historically accurate. Uh, Josephus sometimes does that, so you have to be careful when you reference him. But we know this happened because Scripture tells us at least the event happened. But he describes Herod coming into this amphitheater, and he goes in at dawn just as the sun is rising. The sun hits him. It's directly on him. He's wearing this really uh, silver outfit of some sort from head to toe. And according to Josephus, as the sun shines on him, there is, there's this aura or glow. Well, then Luke tells us here that as Herod speaks to the crowds, they're saying, this is the voice of a God and not a man. And Josephus adds in his version that the people are even saying this, be thou merciful to us, for although we have hitherto reverenced thee only as a man, yet shall we henceforth own thee as superior to mortal nature. So here's, jo here's Herod Agrippa. He's basking in his own perceived glory here. But Luke says in verse 23, Because he did not give glory to God, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down. Basically, God struck him down. And he was eaten by worms, and he breathed his last. Well, Josephus, as he often does, he adds a little more color, saying that he had this horrible abdominal pain that lasted for five days, and then finally he died. Now, the practical medical reason for his death or the circumstances surrounding it is, is not the important thing to grasp here, but the fact that God struck him down. There was an intervention of the sovereign holiness of God. Now, doesn't that remind you of the story of King Belshazzar in the book of Daniel? He's at this feast, right? And the enemies are at the gates of Jerusalem, and what is he doing? Well, he's having a party. And while he's engaged in this party and various activities, immediately the fingers of a human hand appear and begin to write on the wall of the king's palace. Now, that sounds creepy enough, but, but it's even more frightening when the words are translated. It, the words say, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. God sees. He saw the pride of this man. And after Daniel recounts what happens 
to Nebuchadnezzar for Belshazzar, that's Belshazzar's father, in Daniel 5, he says in verse 22, And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this. So God hears, He sees, He intervenes. We live in a supernatural world. It, it's no different today than it was then. Such tyrants like Herod Agrippa, who could behead the disciple James, and who would have done the same to Peter if God had not taken him out from under his nose. These tyrants are nothing before the one true sovereign God. God has already taught Herod a lesson by taking Peter out from under his nose, and now because he refuses to give God glory, God strikes him down. God hates pride. Proverbs 6, 17. God hates haughty eyes. James 4, 6. God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. What a fearful lesson for these Old Testament tyrants. And for this New Testament tyrant, King Herod Agrippa. Herod was a religious man. He was of Jewish descent. And whenever Herod Agrippa was in Jerusalem, he went every day to the temple. He engaged in purification rites. He was a religious man, but his religion availed him nothing. And God struck him down. Just as God came down in judgment on Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, he didn't exact uh, immediate retribution and strike them dead on the spot, although he could have done that. But when Adam disobeyed, both of them died spiritually, mind, will, and emotions, and they would eventually die physically. And through Adam's sin, he brought death to the whole world, him and all of his progeny. He also, God also put them out of the Garden of Eden, and he brought flaming swords and a seraphim to guard the entry back into the garden. So just as God came down in the days of Noah, and he obliterated the whole world except for eight souls, just as God came down upon Nadab and Abihu for offering strange fire to him. Just as he came down in Acts chapter 5 on Ananias and Sapphira for lying to the Holy Spirit. God is holy. He, he's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He is not to be toyed with. He is not to be mocked. It's a serious thing to walk in fellowship and communion with the one true God. That's the lesson Luke wants us to see here, that tyrants like Herod Agrippa are nothing before a sovereign God, and He can do it again. The second lesson we see here, and it's a much more comforting lesson, it's the other side of the coin, is that there's nothing to, for the church to fear. You know, I love Psalm 34, where it basically says, a pretty long psalm, but it basically says, if you fear God and you reverence God, then you have nothing else to fear. If we reverence God and fear Him, then what are men? What are tyrants? What are persecutors? You know, the church must have felt very small before Herod Agrippa. The church was several thousand people at this time. But in comparison to the mighty Roman army that stretched throughout the whole of Eastern Europe and North Africa, the church was, was nothing compared to that. The church was this tiny little pinpoint. And the skirmishes that the Herods had to deal with in Judea were barely even under consideration. They, they were no match for the Roman forces. But here's the thing. When God is on your side, you may be up against dark forces, you may be uh, up against the forces of the civil authorities and the powers. You may be up against philosophical systems that mock you and disparage you. But when we read Psalm 124, we read that if it had not, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel say now, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive. When their anger was kindled against us, then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters. And then we read, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Psalm 124, this great psalm of assurance of the people of God, especially in times of opposition and persecution. <laughs> you know, I read somewhere that the Covenanters sang this psalm during the killing times in Scotland back in the late 1600s. The killing time was a period of conflict between uh, 
Scottish, uh, in, in, excuse me, in Scottish times in, in Scotland between the Presbyterian Covenanters and really the government forces of King Charles II and James VII. The Covenanters were those people who remained steadfast in their biblical doctrine in refusing to take an oath to the king, saying that the king was head of the church. Instead, they said, no, Christ alone is the head of the church. They were severely punished for that and for their stance, persecuted. But as they were being persecuted, they sang Psalm 124. No matter the opposition, no matter the tyranny, of course, tyranny and opposition may come in all manner of forms. It, it, may, it might not even be the opposition of a, of, a, of a tyrant or a dictator. It might be the sole opposition of the evil one in causing us to doubt the goodness of God, causing us to doubt the sovereignty of God, causing us to doubt the purposes of God and that all His purposes will be accomplished according to His promises. Now when Jesus says to His disciples in Caesarea Philippi, in Matthew 16, when he says to them, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. But you know, we're always tempted to doubt, aren't we? When sickness comes or when we lose a loved one, when terror knocks on our door, uh, when we wake up in the middle of the night and all of our hopes and dreams and aspirations are, seem to be gone, but God's purposes can never be thwarted. They can never die. The word of the Lord will endure forever. And those who love Jesus Christ and trust in Him, He will take home to be with Himself. So there's nothing for us to fear. Not death, not tyrants, nothing. Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Absolutely nothing. There's a third thing here, and that is that God always accomplishes His purposes. And yes, He accomplishes His purposes through all things through our trials, yes, through our sin and our brokenness, through everything. It is true to say that God accomplishes purposes despite our trials. And, and that's the way we normally like to think of it. Because we all want to live in a perfect world, don't we? But Luke is saying here much more than that. In Acts 12, verse 24, that verse just leaps off the page, doesn't it? After what we've just read, it's, it's like a flashing light. Because all of these terrible things are, happen, are happening at the same time, and as a consequence of it, in the midst of it all, it says the Word of God increased and multiplied. God's church continues to grow. God's purposes continue to be realized. The Word of God was prospering. It was growing. It was multiplying in the midst of trials. And it's interesting, you know, a couple of things briefly. It's interesting here that Luke substitutes. Instead of saying the church was multiplying or increasing, or the kingdom was multiplying or increasing, he says the word increased and multiplied. Do you notice that? Because here what, he's, what he means is that the people of God were multiplying. Because what is taking place through the ministry of the word? When the word of God is being preached and taught, when it's being prayed and sung, people are converted. God's promises are fulfilled. His kingdom advances powerfully. His purposes are accomplished. So the word of God increasing and multiplying, in a sense, is saying the same thing as the, the, the kingdom, the church, is increasing and multiplying. You know, in one sense, it's, it's strange to preach on the death of Herod and how, how he's, he was eaten by worms. But I love this passage because this is Church Growth 101. I mean, I mean, how does the church grow? Well, we don't read about any conferences here. There are no famous names being brought in, you know, celebrity Christians come, being brought in to help the church grow. Uh, it's talking to the church and saying, well, everything will start growing when things are going smoothly. Or we'll really start to see some church growth when the nation is on our side. If we could just get us to live in a Christian nation, whatever that means. None of that. These men and women are living in the teeth of terror and hell on a daily basis. The church is growing in the midst of opposition, in the midst of tyranny. When a time when you couldn't be a nominal Christian. It wasn't possible. You put your life on the line when you confessed your faith. You're either with Christ and for Christ and living for Him or you're a pagan. And the church was growing. 
No, no great training schemes here. Now, I'm not opposed to training. But you don't have to have training schemes to speak about Jesus. Because for these men and women, it was, it was a life or death thing. They loved Jesus so much, they just didn't care what happened to them. Because Jesus and their faith in Him was the most important thing to them in all the world. This is what Jesus calls the law of harvest. Remember when He says in John 12, verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. There has to be death in order for life to come. It's the same principle for Paul when he writes to the Corinthians. He's talking about their sufferings. Remember in 2 Corinthians 4? He says, so death is at work in us, but life in you. And he goes on to say, well, I'm, basically I'm prepared to suffer all the tyranny so long as life and blessing is coming to you. You know, this amazing story in the mid-1800s, there was a Scottish missionary by the name of John Payton. And, and he, he believed God was calling him to minister to the cannibals on the New Hebrides Islands of the South Pacific. Now, Payton was an or, ordained by the Reformed Presbyterian Church on March 23, 1858. And on April 2nd, he married Marianne Robson. And 14 days later, on April 16th, they both sailed from Scotland to the South Pacific. When they arrived on one of these New Hebrides islands, an island named Tanna, a Canadian missionary, John Getty, he had been there already laboring since 1846. As I said, in those days, the natives of those islands were cannibals. Well, three months after Mary and John Payton had arrived, their son Peter was born on February the 12th, 1859. Just 19 days later, Mary died from tropical fever, soon to be followed to the grave by their newly born son, Peter, who had died 30, after just 36 days of life. So John buries his wife and his child close to his home, and he has to go out and sleep on their grave at night to protect them from the local cannibals. Undaunted by his task and these tragic circumstances, Peyton continued with his work, his missionary work, in spite of constant animosity from the natives, many attempts on his life. During one attack, a ship arrived just in time to rescue him and to take missionaries from another part of that island to safety. So he returned to Scotland for a short time, but he, he didn't go to Scotland because he gave up. He actually went back there to create greater interest in the work of the New Hebrides Islands. He wanted to recruit new missionaries, especially to raise a large sum of money for, to, for a building project he wanted to do, and also to upkeep for a sailing ship that would service the missionaries in the work of the islands of the New Hebrides. You know, oftentimes when missionaries would go to these places in the world, they would literally pack their belongings in a coffin because they knew that good chance they were going to die while they were doing their work. But during this time in Scotland, when he was back there, gaining support, raising support, all that, he met and married Margaret Whitecross. Well, they go back to the New Hebrides Islands, August 1866, and John and his new wife, Maggie, established a new mission station there. It was a different island, Anawa Island, the nearest island to Tana. They managed to build a house for themselves, two houses for orphan children. Later on, a church and a printing house and other buildings were erected. They continued their missionary work, and it was there in Anawa where six of their ten children were born, four of whom died in early childhood or in infancy. The Paytons endured many, many years of deprivation, danger from the natives, disease, and they saw very little fruit for most of their ministry. But after years and years of patient ministry, eventually the entire island of Anawa Professed Christianity. You see, John Payton realized the urgency of the gospel. And he was a fanatic in the sense that what counted most to him was knowing that your sins have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ and that we only have a short time to let others know that same truth. God lit a fire in this man, John Patton, 
And once God the Holy Spirit ignites a fire in the hearts and lives of His people, there is no way to quench it. You cannot put it out. God always accomplishes His purposes, not merely despite the tyranny and the opposition, but because of it, because of the opposition. We see that in our text this morning. Because of this opposition, the church was emboldened to speak with even more urgency the truth in Jesus Christ. You know, we really do have an easy and a comfortable life here in the West. And not to, not to in any way minimize, you know, COVID virus, the things in the life loss from people doing that. But really, this is, and, and some people I know, I know this has been tough. They, they've lost jobs and, and that kind of thing. But for most of us, I mean, the vast majority of us, it's just been a minor inconvenience. You want the church in the West to grow? You want the church in America to grow? Be careful what you pray for. Because often that recovery will come in the wake of the fiercest opposition, tyranny, all kinds of horrific circumstances. Yet at the same time, we can never forget that the tyrants like Herod Agrippa are nothing before a sovereign God. He will always accomplish His purposes. Father, thank you for this portion of your word today. And we ask that you'll apply it to our hearts and lives as only you can do. Lord, remind us of the promises in your word. Encourage us. Help us to be faithful. Help us to not whine so much when things don't go right. And Lord, see it as your, as your sovereign plan. Not to minimize suffering. It, it, that's not the point. But just to see that you have an overall plan for, for us individually for your church. Help us to embrace that and trust you in all things. We ask that today in Jesus' name. Amen.